Hello, yes, that's right, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV, and today I am joined all the way from Australia by Paddy Butler, coming from Jervis Bay, just to the south, two hours south of Sydney in Australia. And um, yeah, if you didn't know, Paddy is the current Hobie 14 world champion. And um, as you may have seen on Joyrider TV, I've been away competing in the Hobie 14 class. So uh, Paddy has volunteered to get involved with this Q&A and answer your and mine uh, most pressing Hobie 14 related questions. Very good. Um, so first of all, Paddy, have you, uh, you said you were just starting your summer holiday, uh, Easter holidays. So Paddy, Paddy's a school teacher. Um, I, have you got any competitions in that time? that we so not really it's just the it's the uh it's the end of the season here in australia so we've just sort of we're just sort of on the um we're winding up the uh the first half of our championship tour down here in australia so we've had the first half of the year all of our events sort of just starting to rack up wrap up um we've got a couple of events coming up prior to um the europeans which i'm still very much umming and ahhing about, trying to have to decide whether to go or not. Money is the biggest thing there. Um, the Euro for the European Championships in, in Lake Garda. Um, but we, down here in Jervis Bay at the Vincennia Sailing Club, which is my home club, we have a, uh, like a, 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 a uh, how do I say it? Like an end of season regatta coming up in the next three weeks. So... That'll be the last weekend of our school holidays. So we've got two week, two days of sailing, um, the last weekend of that last weekend of April, which is the last weekend of our sailing season here in Australia. Um, so the weekend of sailing, then we've got another regatta in June, which is midwinter, like it's a midwinter regatta, um, up in Queensland. So a bit warmer, which would be nice. Other than that, that's um, that's the regattas I've got lined up. A lot of um, I've got a lot of uh training though happening um at the Vincennia Sailing Club where I'm from down here in Jervis Bay, just um, youth training. So got a lot of youngins um just starting out on the dragoons, the Hobie dragoons. Um, a few of them are progressing from the wave to the dragoon. Um, so getting them race ready and getting them getting some early prep for um for the next season, which will be in kicking off in September. Oh, nice, man. And from all of the regattas that have been going on in Australia for the whole season, uh, there's some pretty excellent coverage of all of that on Totally Immersed TV, which people... Totally should... Immersed TV, that's where the, all the uh, the backstage type content is. Um, You'll find all that there on Totally Immersed TV, which is there, the official channel for the Australian uh, Hobie class. Got all our match reports online, but um, Totally Immersed TV is on YouTube is the best spot to find that sort of backstage content and find out, you know, what the sailors are doing off the water very much so. Um, and uh, I've just got to get uh, get my act together these school holidays and get a bit more um, sailing footage out there. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think you've got a lot content. to you've got a lot to give. No, we got so much. We got so much happening down here. Yeah, just a matter of um, getting it out there. But your um, your kind of backstage videos, as you put it, are so good because they really give you a, a vibe of what it's like to be at the event and meeting the sailors and and stuff. So you, it gives. I think it does give you more of an idea of what the event's like rather than what I'm doing, where it's just like you can watch me get it wrong around the race course for a day. And um, yeah, so it's completely different angle of coming at it, but it's so nice to see, and it oh, awesome. def Cheers, man. definitely in the in the European winter there is a big kind of like um, jealousy kind of thing because it all all these events look like so much fun, and um, the vibe on the beach is always really nice, and uh, it's a really nice community that you've got there. Whereas everyone's sort of sat in their coats. Uh, putting another log on the fire kind of thing. Uh, a lot of people who are watching Joyrider TV have probably got snow outside as well. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, big jealousy sort of factor there. But yeah, that's, uh, a, that's another thing we've tried to play before uh, um, in the past is to say, like, to everyone in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere is be like, look at all, like, we're doing this in our summer. Hopefully, um, hopefully it gets everyone keen in the Northern Hemisphere leading into the summer for, for you guys up there. So, yeah, that's that's another thing we've been, we've been playing at is, like, you know, tune in, look what we've been doing in our summer get keen and and start ripping in yourselves um for yours yeah not definitely yeah certainly basically. gets you in the mood yeah. yeah and um all right so i think um we'll crack on with um some what what i kind of the question i was going to do this as a sort of what i found from sailing in the american hobie 14 nationals but i think better is for me to sort of say what I think I understand and then you can put us all straight. Um, so this is in no particular order. So the first topic on my list is that of rig tension. And um, I don't think I've ever sailed with a rig quite as loose. Um, is obviously the length of the four stay is just going to set your mast rake so um that is set but the the rig tension set on the shrouds is it so loose so that uh is it purely for going downwind so when you go downwind uh the mast goes forwards and you've got more power or is it also so that it can lean off to leeward as well on the upwind i'll tell you what i hate sailing with a sloppy rig um with a loose rig, I hate it. I can't stand it. I just um, I just find the mast shaking back and forth to be the most irritating thing. So like I started sailing with a tight rig, just because of that. Um, but what we found, we did a lot of, we've done a lot of boat on boat stuff down here in Australia between myself um and MB, my dad, Nick Butler, um. And even, um, and yeah, and a lot of the guys down here in Jervis Bay. So, like, not afraid to say that we've got some of the best Hobie 14 sailors in the world right here in Jervis Bay where I'm from. Um, so, we've done a lot of, a lot, a lot of time on the water um, in, our, in our time in the last couple of years. So, we, so we've, if you, we've experimented a lot with rig setup. And the biggest thing is what we found is you don't you don't want a sloppy rig. Once you're out on trapeze, you want a tight rig. That's the number one. But you don't you don't want it too tight. When I say too tight, you want to make sure your mast is still able to rotate. Um, when you've got a really tight rig, the mast doesn't want to spin around as much. So it's to the point where you are tightening the rig to to the point like. If you've got no main sheet on, you want to look at the rig and be like, pull the shroud and go, that's really tight. Whereas when you crank your main sheet on, it'll slacken off just that little bit. Yeah. So you, yeah, <laughs> so you don't want that. So you want a tight rig once you, and that's once you're out on trapeze. So once you're trapezing, which is what I saw in some of the um, race footage from you, Joe, was that once you're out on trapeze with that sloppy rig, with that loose rig, in the lull, the mast would come back on top of you and your windward shroud would, would loosen off. Whenever your windward shroud is loosening off, like jumping off the wire, Yeah. One for one, it means your rig's too loose. But also, if your windward shroud is... It's the same thing on a Hobie 16. If your windward shroud goes slack, get the crew in off the wire straight away. It's hard on a Hobie 14 to be in and out, in and out. Um, off the wire so you've got to find that happy medium of okay i'm hiking to about 12 knots over 12 knots out on trapeze constantly like so i've done a lot of practice myself and like i'm not heavy i'm 62 kilos so i'm my like myself and Bryn um robinson mills our national champion at the moment like we're out on trapeze early earlier than say myself and um sorry not myself um mb my dad and um rod waterhouse 
we're at on trapeze that little bit earlier. So we've got that little bit of advantage in the mid range conditions. Uh, but once it's everyone trapezing, then it's a level playing field. So I think the biggest thing is tight rig if you're trapezing because it just stops that mask flopping over on either on top of yourself or over too much. And then it's just in the light, it's in the light air because what we do, we sail with that traveler that little bit out and allowing the rig to flop over a little bit more, lay off basically is it keeps that leech straight up and down. Right, okay. Um, that's the biggest thing. So, that, and, and, and it took a while, and we re we really only discovered that um, in June last year, which was a month before, um, a month before the Hobie 14 Worlds. So we did, a, we did a regatta on the Gold Coast, sailing out of Corumban Alley, and this regatta was called the Bad News Regatta. It's like a, it's a um, memorial regatta for um, an ex, an old Hobie sailor. His nickname was Bad News. Um, and what, what it was, was my dad won five out of five races. I got second five out of five races. And Rod Waterhouse got third five out of five races. And what we found was dad sailed with a very loose rig in that two up from the bottom setting that I talked about um, in that video. I sail with a tight rig in my normal setting. And I think Rod was the same as myself, just in a standard setting on the sides. Um, and dad, and what we found was dad was beating us to the top mark every time. We're not getting, be he wasn't getting better starts. He just had that little bit more boat speed, just slightly more, um, just with that looser rig. And that's what we found. So, after the bad he regard, like and I just could not catch him. I could not catch him and it was infuriating. Um, because I'm going from we're going dad and I go pretty much tit for tat in most races. Um, so yeah, he was in front every single race and I had no chance of catching it. Um that was the biggest thing we and it was the light conditions and what we've discovered in the light, light conditions is that we feel here is that a bit more weight in the light air and a little bit more chop, um, a little bit more weight on the boat actually is in your favour. Feel like the boat's more grounded in the water. So it helps a bit to more sort of, traction. Yeah, and you actually push through the chop. If there's chop, it helps it push through. But if even even if it's flat water, a bit more traction lay the boat down. But it's just that. So once it gets to about, and that's like zero to five knots sort of thing. I reckon oh, we we believe that yeah, a bit more weight on the boat actually helps. Upwards of five knots when you're getting a bit more lift of the windward hull, a bit more power. The lighter sailors will start um, ripping in a little bit more. But then once it's trapping across the field about twelve knots, level playing field. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've I've often found that actually in the past that in the mega light stuff because I've always run a heavy team on whatever type of boat that I'm sailing, just because I'm I'm like 92 kilos, um, that when it's mega light, I'll do pretty well. But then as soon as it gets marginal and the lighter crews can start to lift the hull a bit, then you get um, you get punished. And then, of course, yeah. once it's full power, double trapeze downhaul on, then the weight really helps on the upwind. To like, oh, yeah. Yeah. So like in the 14s, as soon as it was downhaul on trapezing, I had really good boat speed upwind and uh, could pretty much hold everyone off. Um, but then, of course, I'd get a little bit, a little bit done on the downwind. If Yeah, it's always the case. You've just, it's always, it's always, and I've always been that struggle on the upwind, gain on the downwind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you just and you just play it around, and it's the same with the big boys. It's like they gain on the upwind, lose on the downwind. So it's 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 it, it ends up being level across the board. Yeah, it almost depends um, on if they do an upwind or a downwind finish. To yeah, who's going to have the the benefit? I mean, I I love an upwind finish. I think it's a six geo course on the Hobie. ICA standard race course. It's a two lap upwind finish. I love the upwind finish. I think it's so exciting. Um, 
and it's that last little beat up win that and it's a and it's a proper send on that up win. You just go fast. Yeah. Um and then the downwind like we did downwind finishes at the nationals and they were um they were pretty tight and it's just that constant downwind just trying to catch every possible wave you can. Yeah. Um towards the finish on that second lap. It um it keeps it really tight. So look I, I love the swapping and changing of courses depending on the regatta. <laughs> I think it's really fun. Um, and I think, yeah, we had the standard, like, 2GO course at um at uh, at the Hobie Worlds and then at the, um at our Nationals as well. Actually, we didn't have a, we didn't have a um, offset at our Nationals um, in Brisbane, which was a bit different. It made things a bit dicey at times. I actually, I nosedived, pitch pulled on the first race because of it. I didn't have that, didn't have that time between a top mark and an offset to untangle a very serious tangle between my main sheet and my windward rudder. Oh god! And as I bore away around the top mark to go straight downwind, I just went. Oh man! Proper cartwheel, and I got, there's there's pretty good photos of it. That that was the first race of our nationals, and I tipped over on the second windward mark rounding and lost ten boats, and I thought, well. I feel like this is a bad vibe for the rest of the regatta, and it was. Oh, that man. was our nationals yeah. um, back in January. <clears throat> All right, on on to next next topic, perhaps quite related to the rig tension, and maybe it's because my rig was too loose that I was feeling this. But um, and a lot of people are asking the question because from your masterclass video, I took. I took uh, some of that as absolute gospel, like with the traveller position on the upwind, I didn't have the traveller closer than, um, I suppose, about four inches from the centre line at any time. So it was always out a bit. Um, and um, with the, and that seemed good. It seemed to always, so the sail was never anywhere close to stalling, but then I felt as well as having the traveller loose, I'd have to have the main sheet, not what I'd consider to be tight. Like I could have pulled it in, like the blocks were maybe that far apart, whatever that is. And I could have cranked it in more, but every time I cranked it in, even when it was windy, I just felt I was flattening the sail too much and it was kind of choking. Um, but, I think the style that I was sailing upwind was very much uh, kind of footing, going for speed. Uh, perhaps because of my extra weight, I could go a lot faster than the lighter guys. So I thought I'd make use of that. But would you say there's any truth in that, that if you crank the main too tight, you're going to flatten the sail too much? I'll tell you, it's just like, yeah, 100%. Like, but you've, you, And you've just got to watch your telltales and on your sail. And and just read the sail itself. Like I um I sail so in the masterclass video I um I had like an eighties eighties mainsail and I love that rag. Like it is so old and I've sailed it in twenty five knot plus conditions countless times. Um and that's the sail that I use at most regattas basically every regatta other than a national championships or world championships. Um, and I feel like with that, with that rag, I can just crank it and crank the downhaul on, crank the main on and it, and it goes and it, and, and it flattens out, but I'm never oversheating it. I find, whereas with a new mainsail, um, like my white and the blue stripe where the Hobie H is, which I used in the Hobie worlds, um, in the 14 worlds in in Cincinnatica, like I find that I'm, I'll oversheet that a lot easier than I would with the old main. Um, I remember our the state championships we had here in Jervis Bay uh, a couple of years ago. I um in the marginal conditions, it was in those conditions where you're like you're just jumping out or you're not jumping out. Um, it was about you know eight to ten knots. And for me, it was either jump out or not jump out. And I'm, and at that time, I was jumping out on wire because another another sailor similar weight to me was jumping out on trapeze, and he was going and he was putting and he was sailing so quick and so fast. And I was like, 
how can I match this? And what I found without realising, as soon as I go out and wire and crank on, I was oversheeting the main. Um, and as soon as you start oversheeting the main, it just it just starts, you just don't have the same power as you would do if it was, you know, tall tails were running perfect. So that's just the biggest thing to watch out on is like once it's blowing you around a trapeze, you generally don't have to worry about it when, when it's blowing. But in that light stuff, it's very much watching the telltales and consistently looking up your sail to be like, okay, I'm oversheeted. Okay, I'm not oversheeted. Like I need a bit more, bit more main on type thing. So it's just a matter of keeping, um, keeping on top of it, I guess. Um, but hundred percent, you're so so easy to oversheet the boat. Yeah, and it's in the light stuff. Um, like once once it's blowing, I'm not even looking at um, looking at telltales once it's properly glowing. Yeah, because it's not actually um, possible once I'm, to oversheet. Yeah, you're no, oversheating like you. once I'm yeah. proper looking at telltales and and the beauty with the fourteen is you got your mass rotation. Um, and like mass rotation is your friend, it's your best friend basically. Like. It is, it is, it is, it changes the power that you have on the upwind so much. Um, like I'll have my master rotation all the way in, um, most of the time, like pointing towards the, um, the corn, the back corner casting. And then as it gradually picks up, just letting it out, letting it out to the point when it's 15 plus, I'm letting the master rotation all the way out. So that it's pointing straight down the front beam. Yeah. Um, and like I, I, I just remember this one-on-one session that I did with myself and my mate Bryn, our current national champion. We, um, he was on an old, an old, old Hobie fourteen, like an eighty, seventy, late seventies boat. It was a heavy old girl. Her, her, the boat's name was um, was uh, Bad Becky. So Bryn was on Bad Becky, and I was on my eighties boat. Um, cheeky too and we were just going going out in a in a pretty windy um, sea breeze down home and I just found Bryn was climbing away from me and I just could, and I could not match him for speed or height and I was like what is going on like he's on an older boat a heavier boat and he's sailing higher and faster than me and I had nothing I could not even match him um, and his mass rotation was all the way out like he didn't even pull his mass rotation on the thing was just loose and it's pointing straight down the front beam and he was just cranked on block to block and just going for it. And I'm like, okay, so I jump in off the wire, crank, my down wall was cranked. So all I did was just let my mass rotation all the way out. What you, what that allows you to do because you let your mass rotation all the way out, you've got more mass bend. So you can then pull your traveler back in. Um, that's if you've been letting traveler out just because you're so overpowered. So as you let your mass rotation out, you can pull your traveler back in again. So you get a little bit more power in that sense. Um, and what I did was I let my mass rotation all the way out, down the front beam, cranked back on again. I had a wire and I just sailed higher and faster than Bryn was already. And I just went from being below him to like down here to being up over here. It was insane. I'd, I'd never, never done anything like it. And that was what, that was when I, and I'd, and I'd just got my mass rotation installed on the old boat, like two weeks before that, yeah. that session. And I was like, wow, that was insane. So um, that mass rotation is such a big thing. Yeah. Just, um, just on that, what, um, what did, uh, what did you have to actually do to install it on an older boat? So in, this would actually be a great YouTube video. Um, in the so this is where the this is where I'm bouncing into the IHCA class rules. Um, so in the which is what we mentioned to Eric and stuff in the um, at the worlds was that in the IHCA rule book there's a set height that you have um, the, that the mass rotation is supposed to be put in at. Yeah. Um, that height is incorrect, so incorrect it's not funny. So if I had my 80s main sail um, in Italy, or if I if I was sailing a boat, like if I had my 80s main sail on a boat with that 
where that mass rotation is. I don't know the measurements off off the top of my head. Um, but what happens with the old cells is that they stretch so much so that with an old main cell, like the, my blue and rainbow one, if I had my mass rotation at that specified setting, I would not be able to crank my downhaul on fully. Because what had happened is I'd pull my downhaul on, but my main cell would come down and it would hit that mass rotation yeah. bar and I wouldn't actually be able to rotate my mass because I've pulled too much downhaul. And that's because the sails stretch over time. Um, it's not an issue with a brand new main sail because you don't get as much, um, you can't pull it down as much with the downhaul. And we didn't face that issue in um, in Italy, in Cessnatico. So we had like um, charter boats with the mass rotation at that set height. Um, but yeah, if, if so in Australia, most of our mass rotation um, are probably, I don't know, 20 millimetres, I want to say at least, so at least oh, five centimetres lower, I guess. Yeah. That's just off the top of my head. Like, hmm. this is my dad who's done most of these. So my old man works at the Hobie factory. He's built basically every Hobie 16, um, put together every Hobie 16 to go to a Worlds between... Florida and which is 2019 and I'm going to get fact checked here but at least 2007 where he won um, so he's done a lot of work on these masks on these Hobie 14 masks um, so it's getting it to that setting that's right I'm just looking at a photo now of my old boat with my old main and yeah. those old main sails they, they stretch so much so you get so much and and what and what we found here as well, like at um totally different topic, but um at our national championships in Brisbane um back in January, we had um it was pretty bloody windy a lot of the time. And when I was out there in the breeze, I I was like saying to myself, I wish I had my old main cell right now. Mm. I just find those um those eighties those eighties rags are just so forgiving in the in the breeze. I feel like I honestly feel like I've got more power and I was sailed with that sail a lot more in the blow that I feel like I know the sail. I know the rag a lot better that at their nationals, I, I would have rather had an eighties main sail rather than my brand new main, just because I knew the sail a lot, a lot better in the breeze. And I felt that that old rag was that little bit more forgiving and you could crank that downhaul so low. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I've sailed sixteens with old main sails, and you just feel you can push it so hard. Whereas with a new one, it feels yeah. like it almost, oh, even with the downhaul on tight, overpowers really a lot sooner. You have, I think you have a lot more. You haven't got the ability to flatten off a new one quite as much as with mm, an old one. Time. Yeah, you haven't got um, that sort of ability. But mind you, like in the marginal conditions, like like mid range mm. champagne sailing, I'll say, um, you want it, you want fresh sails. Oh man, it's only that really windy conditions where I'm like, I wish I had an old rag on. But mm. in those light to mid range conditions, like if I had an old rag compared to a brand new mainsail, um, I'd be getting getting my my bottom kicked. That's for sure. Like you, 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 you'd love a brand new mainsail in the light to mid range in most conditions. It's only that really windy stuff where, where I'm like to myself, oh, I wish I had the old main on right now. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's part of me going, um, I'm conscious about flogging my, my good main. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to wreck it. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm quite attached to that white with the blue strip. Um, the six double three eight. So anyway, that's just me. But um, <clears throat> but my dad sailed sailed the nationals with the oldest rag he's got. Like a, it is a shocking mainsail. It's a yellow. It's like yellow with um two panels of rainbow. Um, Rob Waterhouse hates it. He hates the sail because dad um manages to beat him in a few races with that old mainsail on and um. 
and it's a shocking sale. Like it's so old, it's so baggy, but you get the right battens in it, and it um, and you get the right shape in the main sail, and it um, and it goes really well. On to um, downwind sailing. This was this was one of the biggest things for me to get my head round, having never done it before. But um, sailing straight downwind. Um, I did at the start of the regatta, I did feel that I'd just start going downwind and it's like, right, come on, who, who wants to sail past me? Um, and um, what I what I kind of felt was working better was when I was going beyond dead downwind. Like uh, we did talk about this a minute ago, but um, sailing by the lee like people would do on a laser where your leech is actually further towards the wind than your mast is um it just it just felt like she wanted to go a little bit more but um so um what um what would you say i know you we've already talked about this by the way um before we started and paddy said no that's wrong <laughs> but um well i don't know like I, I actually no like listening to it now i think you just got to play it on the day and the conditions. I mean, on the light stuff, you could probably do that. At, like, by the, I've never heard that term, to be honest, by the way. Um, you could probably push that a little bit more on the downwinds, on, in the light air. Um, like, I, like, on the downwind on the Hobie 14, we've, we've figured out that, like, you go dead downwind, like, straight down, straight down. It just, it's the most, it's the, it's the percentage play, basically. Mm every time you go a little bit higher you're not gaining anything if you're not gaining speed by going higher which you don't you don't gain speed if you go a little bit higher on the downwinds you don't gain anything from it like you would on a like a hobie 16 going that sort of perpendicular angle you're not gonna you're not gonna gain anything on a hobie 14 by going that further distance because you're not going you're not going much faster and by sailing further distance and not going much faster you're obviously gonna lose places compared to people going dead down shorter distance for the same speed um essentially actually last weekend we did a little thing as well between dad and i and um it was choppy it was light light breeze but it was quite choppy um and i was popping a rudder up on the downwinds and dad mb had two rudders down and those conditions i should be overtaking him but he I just couldn't gain anything and he had it he actually got, um increased the gap between us um just because he had two rudders down rather than one rudder up in the light air um could only because it was choppy so it was the light air but choppy and what we found was that two rudders down he got that little bit more traction the boat's not and what I was struggling with was like I didn't have as, as much traction on the downwinds that every little wave I got, I'd, I'd bounce sideways almost, or I'd lose control a little bit with one rudder up. Um, so in most conditions, it's one rudder up downwind. Um, but yeah, in that light, choppy conditions, um, two down, and it made a lot better steering on the downwinds. But um, So would you say that uh, but it, if, um, if you did sail in regular conditions with two rudders down, that you're just going to get people are going to sail past. Oh, you're you. not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to get sailed. You're not going to get, um, you won't get overtaken as such. It's just one rudder up the same on a heavy 16. You've got that little bit more control. It's a little bit more touchy and yeah. you can, um, like it's the controls are a lot easier. You've only got one rudder in, so it's less traction for sure, hmm. but you're actually able to, feel the boat a lot more just with one rudder in on the downwinds um you don't want to be doing big turns like if you're steering up and then steering down with one rudder like you just it's not going to happen the boat's just not going to want to go if you're going to do big turns like a bottom mark rounding i've tried rounding the bottom mark with one rudder up and it just doesn't work those big turns so you want two rudders down but on the downwinds when you're not really steering much You've got a lot more. You've got a lot more feel for the boat when you've got one rudder up, a lot more touchy. Um, 
and you've got a lot more feel to be able to catch waves on the downwind. And that and that's one thing I want to go into is that once there's um so it's basically always sail, sailing dead downwind, but as soon as there's a bit of chop and you can catch waves on the downwinds, um, then you're sailing you're sailing for speed. Um, and on the downwinds, once there's a bit of chop, every wave that you get, you gain boats. Um, and so when there's a bit of chop on the, on the, um, when you're coming on the downwinds, if you can catch waves, cause you're going dead downwind, you're always going to go, you, you're always going with, you go basically going with the waves. So when you're, um, when you're, uh, when you're in a race and there's a bit more breeze on, then there's wind chop. I've just like totally get out of my head going dead down wind i'm just sailing for speed and going with the waves so if i have to turn up a little bit to get onto a wave and then bear away again and go down the wave i'm going up and down just to stay on waves and keep going fast because every time you get a wave you go you, you, your speed increases and you're gaining boats same on the hobie 16 like every time you catch a wave on a hobie 16 you bear away to go with the wave so every time you catch a wave on a downwind, you're bearing away to stay with it. So your angle towards the mark, your VMG, increases every time. So it's the same on the Hobie 14. Every time you get a wave, your VMG increases because you're bearing away to go down the wave. Um, so it's just speed. And on the Hobie 40, everyone's going dead downwind anyway. So you come up a little bit to get a wave, and then you catch that wave, and you're actually inc- you might be sailing a little bit higher there, but you're going twice as fast as you usually would be going and are you moving and i've won are you moving for are you moving forwards and backwards on the boat much like getting forwards to get on the wave and then once you're on it moving back slightly or are you generally in the same position would you it, say if you have to it, it depends on your weight 100 yeah. like, like for me i'm central on the boat i'm not having to move forward if i don't have to i, yeah. I might shuffle forward in the lighter lighter breeze to get on the wave um, I was definitely doing that on the weekend when I was actually surfing on the Hobie 16, but um, I'll be generally central, yeah, just to keep the boat that level on that level playing field. It, it just depends on your weight. Like heavier people can sit further forward to get on it, but also once it's blowing, you want to be moving back so your your bows aren't aren't digging in. Yeah, and that's one thing too. In the in the when it's really breezy. Um, We've got a bit of footage of this on the most TV is when it's really proper breezy. Us light light um, skippers can't weigh the boat down as much at the back of the boat. Like if I'm sitting on the back casting as far back as I can go um, and I'm in a big massive gust going dead downwind and there's nothing I can do other than to just watch the boat pitch pole oh, man. and go go over. And that's just because we don't have enough weight at the back of the boat. And, and I've done it reaching like big screaming reaches on the Hobie 14 and I'm right up the back corner, corner casting the boat. I've got one foot on the gun or one foot on the back corner casting and I'm pushing the boat as hard as I can. And my lip, my leeward bow is just digging in just because I don't have enough weight to counteract, you know, the boat wanting to pitch pole at times. So it's very much um, dancing on the edge of the, on a knife's edge, I yeah. guess. Exciting stuff. And like, yeah, and I know I, I do a lot. I know I be and I push it hmm. when I'm not racing. I push it as absolutely hard as I can to find that limit of or that point of no return. Um, and it's generally in that breezy conditions that you find that that point of no return, basically. Yeah. Have you have you um have you tried it on the 14 with a GPS to see how fast you can go? Yeah, big time. Um, we'll crack 20 knots pretty regularly on the reach. When we're reaching, I've um, I've played around with the GoPro on the GPS, but I've never actually had like the proper GPS yeah. mounted on the boat, which I which I want to, and it's definitely something that I'd like to get, but it's um, out of my budget. Yeah, at the moment, um, like I always sell with my I always sell with an Apple Watch on, and it's not accurate um speed. I know that, but um, it gets pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty on the money. Not perfect, but it, it's pretty close. So I'll um, I'll always track my um sailing on my watch. Yeah. Do you know what your so personal app that we? Do you know what your personal best is? Um, I've cracked twenty five on the Hobie sixteen. Um, like that's on a 
that was on flat water, a massive. So it was actually Christmas Day a couple <coughs> of years ago. Got it on my, like I got the speed. I was it was I was going downwind on a Hobie sixteen, twin trapezing, um, flying a hull, going downwind. Nice. It, we had so much apparent. Um, it was it was mental. And I, and I've got it on GPS. Like I've got the like the GPS on a map. And I've got this, and I've got the angle. I'm going down, and then the angle just curves away, and and you can see the point where I'm, um, where we come off the wire. Um, but yeah, no, we were going downwind, a downwind yeah. angle on Hobie 16. We were twin trapezing. Nice. Um, and I like, and my cousin, my co- I was saying with my cousin, he's like, "Well, we were going pretty fast, hey," and I'm like, eyes out of my head, going. Yeah, cars. Yeah, we, we are really <laughs> fast at the moment. Yeah. Um, and like, I, and, I, and I did it um, last weekend over Easter, just going for a bit more speed. And we're cracking 22, 23 on the sixteen. Yeah. Um, and you feel it. You, you 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 know when you're going that fast. It's like I've got two rudders in, so I've got all the steering I can possibly get, and I'm just yeah. going. Oh my goodness. Um let's just hold on for dear life yeah you kind of go to another dimension almost i think when you get when you get that fast you you know it yeah you can feel it on the hobie 14 it's like it's hard to i struggle to really push it on the 14 um because you've got to do it on the reach yeah um and for me reaching on the 14 it's like once i get to the point where i'm like oh i'm gonna get that i'm gonna get close to 25 i'm getting close to 25 and then it'll be nosedive yeah. Um, yeah. She'll that's say, my no, you're not. But like, <laughs> the fastest speeds we, I reckon the fastest speeds we've gotten is in twenty five to thirty knots when we're going dead downwind, mm. and you're just getting gusts coming down quicker than you're sailing, and you get those gusts hit here, and you just go. <sighs> yeah. And and it's a matter of holding on for dear life, basically. Um. But no, like I yeah, we use this app called um Strava. I don't know if it's in Europe. Oh yeah, we Strava. have that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like yeah. Strava's blown up in Australia here basically for running. Like everyone loves running. Yeah, just running is like, it's a new trend apparently. <laughs> running, I've never heard yeah. of it. Or jogging. No, I've never heard of it. Mm. Um, I think I heard of it back in high school, but um, I don't really get into it that yeah. much. I'd rather just go for a, a big old sail. So like everyone's Strava, it's all going five to 10K jogs. Mm. And I'm um and and then there's me in it going for a thirteen to fourteen fifteen nautical mile sail. Yeah. Um, in the middle of it. Um. So yeah, like I we we, we see a bit of speed on that. So that's where we get most of our average speed. It's not accurate, but we get a decent idea of what we've got. Yeah. Nice man. All right, last last question. It's the inevitable one for the Hobie fourteen. Um. What I kind of, I did feel at times that my tacking was improving. And then just when I thought, you know, maybe I've made three good ones in a row, it'd be like the next one, I'd do what I thought was exactly the same thing and had to back up and get round quickly. But what I kind of felt, and this has actually changed my whole tacking policy for any boats, was what I've always felt is, if you crank in really hard on the main sheet as you turn into the tack, it gets you up there quicker. But I felt with the 14, if you over sheet going into the tack, you kill it before you've even got head to wind. And it kind of, it makes it less likely you're going to get out nicely. And then the other thing not, so I wasn't cranking the main in hard when I was doing the good tacks. And the other thing, was just how important it is to stay in control of the rudders. So it was kind of like, if I've got the tiller extension by the time the battens pop, then it's going to be okay. But if I haven't, then the rudders are probably going to not be consistent. And that's when I was blowing the tacks. That's what I thought. So... Yeah, you're right. Oh, it's pretty pretty accurate what you're saying there. It's just like, but like, you know... If you're blowing, you're a Hobie 14 sailor officially now, Joe. If you're that, that, that you like, you get the hope, the tacking a boat is, is so much a skill that's part of the race. Um, and like, if you, 
you know, you lose, like, I think it was in one of the, I think it was maybe the first race, like, you, you lose boats mm. every time you blow a tack. But the beauty of the Hobie 14 is that everyone's in the same boat, you know, like, every, like, so to speak, it's like everyone is in the same situation. Whereas if you blow a tack, you lose boats, but it's happening all around the race course. Um, everyone's blowing tacks here and there. Like, I'll, I'll blow a tack. I hate blowing a tack. It's so frustrating. Or just like a really slow tack. Like, you, you, you see, like, it happens all the time. And that's just, that's Hobie 14 racing um, is, is tacking the boat. And, and, and part, of, part of the race, part of the big, to get those results and to get those, those top placings, you've got to be good at every part of the race. And, and tacking is, is one of those parts, you know, starting, going for speed, tacking the boat, going around top mark and downwind, hmm. you know, the five key areas. Um, but yeah, tack, I think the most important thing to know, and, and this is every, this is individually for people, the most important thing to know and to learn is to, to learn when you've, to learn when you've buggered up your tack. That's, that's the most important thing. <laughs> Cause once you know, when you've, when you've blown, once you realize you've blown your tack, you can, um, you can bail out a lot earlier, so backing it. Mm. Um, so like I like as soon as I realise, oh screw it, I've I've buggered this. The sooner I can back it and get moving again, the better. And and you see it all the time that there's sailors there that are fighting it. They're like playing with their rudders and pulling the main in and out, pulling the main in and out, playing with the rudders, trying to get moving. It's just like stop what you're doing, push your rudders as far as you can, let your traveler out if you have to, push your way out on your boom, back the main and the rudders. And then once you've backed it, straighten your rudders, slightly bearing a right bearing away, straighten your rudders, slightly bearing away, and then cheat on. And once you're moving, then you can actually start steering again. Um that's the biggest part is to know when you've buggered up your tack. And like in those in the breezy conditions, like when it's proper blowing like 18 plus i don't even try and tack the boat like not even i'm not even going to go into attempt to get a good tack all i'm doing is just coming in off the wire pushing the rudders and going for attack but once i've crossed the eye of the breeze i'm backing it straight away um not even, yeah i'm not even trying to pull off a good tack it's just get to the eye of the breeze back the rudders this is once you've crossed the other side of the boat, back the rudders. Um, in the really when it's really really breezy, it's coming off the wire, push really hard, like push on the rudders, go for attack. Before I've even swapped to the other side of the boat, I'll pull the rudders towards myself as if I'm backing it. Yeah. So I pull the rudders towards me, toss the tiller extension around, and then I'll swap sides, grab it again, and the rudders are already back for me as I get to the other side of the boat. Um, main's off already because I've just let it, I've just blown the main and that'll just flop around basically. Um, and then it's, the boat's already backing around and then it's just straighten the rudders and go for it. The big, and another thing is, is not popping your main too early as well. Is if you pop your battens that little bit too early, you've buggered your tack. Yeah. It just dro- takes and, you back up. Yeah. And just basically back it straight away. Yeah. So like, um, so it's just understanding and realizing when you've stuffed up your tack and when you have, back it straight away, push on the rudders, push on the boom, get the bows around and then sheet on and go. That's the most important thing. Like, yeah. And in those really windy conditions, I'm not even attempting to tack the boat. It's just get to the other side, back it and then get moving again. It just is, it, it it comes to the point where is who can get out of irons the quickest. Yeah, basically. So, so it's kind of like if you were going out training, um, going you know if you were new to the fourteen class, if you were going to go out training, you want to practice recovering from a bad tack just as much as you yeah, want to practice exactly. the tacking. Yeah, yeah. Learning and that's what I try and teach my mates is 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 understanding how to get out of irons and once you know. Once you know how to get out of iron, get out of the eye of the breeze, you're sweet. Yeah. 
But Hobie Porter, as soon as you know how to get out of the eye of the breeze and get moving again, your racing goes from five to ten, basically. Mm. Um, so the most important thing on the boat is just, yeah, knowing, yeah, understanding how to get out of irons is almost more important than knowing how to tack in a way. Um, because anyone can attempt to tack um, the boat, but as soon as you know how to get out of irons and get moving again, then your racing goes from, or even just your casual sailing, you know, as soon as you can get out of irons and get moving, you're yeah. sweet. So it's just knowing how to get, and and all it takes, all it is is just push on the rudders, push all the way out on your boom. The bows will naturally come around, straighten your rudders, and the boat will start moving again. Don't start steering and whatnot. Just straighten the rudders, get that clean traction between the hulls and the rudders, and then just sheet on slowly. Yeah. Then start moving again. Nice, man. All right. Um, I think before um, this has been absolutely great, Paddy. I think we could talk about this for hours, but I know it's nearly oh, it's after two o'clock in the morning where you are. I'm just gonna have a quick scan through the live chat to see if there's any yeah. 14 related questions in there. Um, so um, yeah, there is the first, hello, by the way, hello to everybody in the live chat. Um, I hope you're enjoying um, this guys. insight into Hobie 14 sailing with Paddy. Um, so I'll get on to everyone's questions after we finished with uh, the Hobie 14 specific stuff. But uh, one that's in here is from Declan who is, um, he's an Irishman who lives in Sweden. Um, oh, yeah, good. oh, he said, what's your top speed on the 14? We've been there. Um, yeah, between 20, 25. And he says, do you generally sail lower on the 14 than on a 16? Which I, th I think we've addressed that as well, haven't we? Yeah, lower on the downwinds for sure. Yeah, yeah. you go on dead downwind. And then he continues... On the 14, um, what sort of range are you playing the downhaul? Um, so what would be your, I dare say it's different depending on which main sail you're using. But um, so what would be the old sail and what would be the new sail right, downhaul range? Well, I think um, not looking at the range so much, just the how much you can pull on. So like I basically any conditions, like in, even in the light air, I, don't, I just – Pulling on the downhaul to start with, I want to get the clinkers out. Um, and you can see it. Like, I love looking at pictures um, and going, he doesn't have downhaul. She needs more downhaul. They, their downhaul is perfect sort of thing. Like, and you can see it in photos. You look between the battens and you can see the crinkles. I guess crinkles or the, just the folds in the mainsail. Um, like, I'm looking at a photo of myself right now and I'm, trapezing i'm easing there's a photo of me from our state championships which i won um last year and it's a photo of me on trapeze flying a hull and i'm easy and it's me easing mainsail and i'm looking at my downhaul going wolf head like pull your downhaul on you need more downhaul on and mm -hmm. i can just see those the, the slight crinkles in the mainsail um and um it's basically number one is get the crinkles out and then once you're trapezing, number, I, I guess you go, you go through the steps of depowering the boat. The first step when you're depowering the boat is main, is downhaul. You know, crank your downhaul on as hard as you can. Once you've cranked your downhaul on as hard as you can, that's when you start dumping your traveller. And if you're dumping your traveller too much, then it's like, okay, let's go to mast rotation. Let's bring the mast rotation out further. Um so it goes through those steps. But number one is crank your downhaul on and just get the crinkles out. And that's a perfect setting to start with. Um, and then as it gets windier, just keep pulling it on tighter and tighter to the point where when it's blowy, like 17, you know, 16, 17 knots, I've got my downhaul cranked on as hard as I can, basically. Yeah. 18 knots. And that's for me being 60 kilos like of yeah 18 knots downhaul is cranked as hard as i can yeah um pretty much and and you're always going to get mass rotation issues 
and that, and that's another thing too. It depends on the boat as well. Mm. Um, you're always going to get mass rotation issues the more downhaul you pull on. So that's probably the basically keep pulling on downhaul as hard as you can until you get those mass rotation issues. You'll get the counter rotation oh, okay. in the in the mast when you pull on a lot of downhaul. You get on the Hobie sixteen and and it, it's big big thing on the Hobie sixteen. Um, is that counter rotation in the mass when you've got so much downhaul on? Yeah, and I think that's that's the, and that's probably the the play you want to get at here is that like keep cranking on that downhaul as much as you can until you start getting that rotation issue. And if you're getting if you're continually getting that rotation issues in the mass, then you know let a bit of downhaul off and let more traveller out. Okay, basically good to know. Just to just to counteract that um. To counteract it, but like, and but then this is going to Hobie 16 territory. Crank that downhaul on, and if it's cranking so much, like, and, and when the mast is counter rotating, like, let your jib off. You know, the the main reason why the mast counter rotates is because you've got more jib pulled on than mainsail. Yeah. Um, and so like once we're once I'm trapezing on a Hobie Hobie 16, my jib traveler is out. As soon as I'm on double trap, the jib traveler goes out that little bit, and then as it gets windier, jib 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 traveler goes further out. So on those screaming reaches, my jib traveler's all the way out, and the um and the jib's pulled on tight just to open that slot up, and you totally take away the likelihood of counter rotating the mast. Yeah. Cool man. Good stuff. All right, one more from the live chat, and I think this is the last one. Uh, this is from Dopey Dave, who um, you you obviously sail in probably one of the biggest active Hobie 14 fleets in the world. And yeah. um, he's asking, when am I too old for a Hobie 14? What are the what are the oldest people in the fleet who are getting oh, involved? Mate, you're too old for a Hobie 14 when um, when you're in the ground, I reckon. There we are. <laughs> you're never too old, eh? You're too old for Hobie 14 when you're in the ground. Um, or like one of our mates scattered in the bay. Um, so, yeah, like yeah, one of one of our mates passed away a couple of years ago, um, unfortunately from um, from cancer, but he was sailing to his very last last week, week on the earth, you know. Like he, he pushed it as hard as he could for as long as he could. Yeah. Um, old Quinny. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you're never too old and never too young, and like the hope. And this is like, I'm not going to step into the whole weight, the weight ruling and whatnot, but um, the 14 is the perfect boat for kids to jump on. Like, if you've got a if you've got a young kid um who's keen to get into sailing, and you put a laser or a Hobie 14 in front of them, they're they're two sides of the same coin. I feel the laser and the Hobie 14, you know, like. Hobie 14 is the most basic catamaran and lasers almost and and the lasers you know international class same as a 14 um and you've got two boats the kid's gonna have a hell of a lot more fun on a 14 than on a laser you know getting out on trapeze and flying a hull and and doing all that they they love it it's so much fun um and the and the 14 is a perfect boat like um for young kids to get on because like and we saw it in europe as well like we've got we've got um and and like females as well be being a little bit lighter the boat's still competitive you know like in the breeze i'm 60 kegs which is pretty average weight for most of the females in the fleet and you know like they're still highly competitive um as racers um which is epic so it's a very um it's one of the and and Rob Waterhouse put it really well. It's like it's one of the only classes where males and females compete on a level playing field. You know, like in the lazy, you got the late Ilka six and the Ilka sevens. Um, male and females are on different boats, whereas on the Hobie fourteen, male and females are on the same boat. It's same as the Hobie sixteen, you know. Yeah. Male and female are on the same boat, exact same setup, and it comes down to sailors. So, like, actually, our to put it into perspective, like we've in in Europe, so in Australia we've got our state championships are almost like we've got our Australian national championships are like the European 
championships and then each European nationals, I guess, is equivalent to our state championships. Yeah. So we've got our Western Australia, um, Victoria, New South Wales, where I'm from, and then Queensland. Um, and at our recent Victorian um, national cha- um, state, Victorian state championships. Um, so we had Rod Waterhouse, um, Kerry Waterhouse, Rod's wife, and Bridget, um, Bridget, Rod and Kerry's daughter. Jason Waterhouse was too busy doing Sal GP stuff, apparently. Um, so we had three out of the four Waterhouse um, sailors on the water. And um, and I was on the Hobie 16, this, this regatta. And um, Kerry Waterhouse rounded the top mark in first place ahead of Rod, ahead of Bridget, ahead of my dad. Um, and it was one of the coolest things I've seen. Like, I'm, I'm doing my race, but I'm yelling out off my bag going, go Kez, like, rip in. Um, it was epic. So cool to see. And, and Kerry's not jumping out on trapeze um, at all. So she's um, getting out in those mid-range conditions and, and still competitive in the light air, you know? Nice. Um, and at a regatta last year, Kerry... Um, Kerry beat me over the line in the last race of a regatta. I think October last year, it was like a 14 foot only regatta. Kerry beat me over the line. And um, this was just after the 14 worlds, which Kerry, Kerry was at as well. <laughs> Kerry Waterhouse. Um, she beat me over the line. And um, because of that result, my old man MB beat me on count back for that event. So that was the first event I lost after, um, so Dad got first, I got second on count back um, because Kerry beat me over the line in the last race, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Like, I, like, I, like I loved it. It was so sick. Oh, nice. Um, and, she, and she was really chaffed and I was chaffed and Rob was chaffed. And yeah, it was, it was really, really cool. Yeah. And that's the beauty about the 14 is that, yeah, anyone, anyone can do it. So you're never too old. Um, so Kerry and Rod, are, Rod just became a grandmaster this year. Um, oh, sorry, a great grandmaster. So in the Hobie class, you got your masters is forty five and over, grandmasters fifty five and over, and great grandmasters sixty five and over. Kerry's not quite a great grandma. Sorry, masters, grandmasters, great grandmasters is sixty five and over. So Rod's just switched over to a great grandmaster, um, and he won our New South Wales state championships recently. So. Rod was a great grandmaster. He won. My dad is a grand, grand, a grandmaster, so he's 56. He got second. Um, and then another mate from Jervis Bay, he's a, another grandmaster. He's he's almost great grandmaster. He's 63. He got third. And me, being 24, um, got fourth. And then it was another great, and then it was another grandmaster, and another grandmaster, then a youth, and then a, another master, and then a uh, women, um, female youth skipper in tenth place. So it was like our recent New South Wales state championships was very much an um, an old boy event, and all all the um all the masters and grandmasters actually yeah. got the good results, which was which was pretty cool. So. Yeah, never too old, never too young. It's just about getting into it. And like one of my really good mates, he's just got into sailing and he's 32. He only, he's only been sailing for the last two years. Um, and he's loving it. He's having the most fun he's had in his whole life. Um, sailing a Hobie 14. And he's getting, and he's slowly seeing that progression himself on the racetrack to the point now he's third um, in our club championship. Oh, nice. Um, which is pretty cool. Wow, that's great. Yeah. I th- Hopefully I was, that answers that question. There's, um, there's a lot of... Um, the, the Hobie wave in the USA is massive. It's such a big class. Mm. And there was some young guys who were saying, what should I step up to from the Hobie wave? And now that I'm a born-again Hobie 14 sailor, there's only one choice. It's like... There's only one choice. There's only I'm one sick. choice. Let's, um, I think... Um, you know, having done my first regatta, I can confirm that, you know, I'm on the heavier end of the racing scale, let's say at 92 kilos, which is about 200 pounds, um, that even 
at my weight in the lighter wind, I wasn't getting killed that badly uh, for boat no, speed. No way. No. Um, and it was so much fun. And um, there's this kind of um, camaraderie amongst the Hobie 14 sailors because it is one of the hardest boats to sail and everyone's going through the same sort of trials and tribulations around the race course and it really bonds the fleet really tightly it's it's a great fleet to be in and i would oh. i would go to the europeans if i wasn't already it's exactly the same time as the um tornado world so i'm committed yeah, to the well, tornadoes it's the same week i think one of the um one of the things that really stand out to me is so rod waterhouse won our new south wales state championships um, back in February, and that's the first event that he's actually won. Like Rod Waterhouse being one of the greatest cap sailors of all time, um, that was the first event that he actually won himself. Like it, it's always Dad, Rod, and I, and it's bouts between myself and MB a lot of the time, first and second, and Rod's in third or Rod's in second a lot of the time to Dad when I'm not on a Hobie 14. Um, um, he's always he's always been. I guess the bridesmaid almost or the best man. But um yeah, so Rod took out the um state championships back in back in February and and one of the things that stood out was Rod, Terry, like having Rod on the boat, Rod's on a boat, Terry's on a boat, Bridget's on a boat, Jason's doing his sale GP stuff in the America's Cup, um, with a lingy. But um he's having like he, he said at a presentation, like he's having the most fun he has ever had sailing right here, right now on a Hobie 14. He's done the Warrell 1000 plenty of times. He's sailed all around the world. He's done countless regattas. Then the most fun he's ever had is is now, is right now sailing Hobie 14 with his wife and daughter and all of us in amongst it. And like, you know, and his grand, his grandchildren, they are just itching to get on the boat. So like he he finished the race, regatta won it, and the first thing he did was get his grandson and granddaughter on the boat, and he just went back out in the water with them. Nice. Um, after the regatta finished, which is unreal, and those kids are those kids are going to be stepping onto a, a wave or a dragoon pretty soon, and then onto a Hobie fourteen in the next probably six years, I hope. Um, but that they'll be he'll be um yeah they'll be very keen competitors pretty soon um that's the beauty of it and like uh, actually looking at the wave thing um we've got two hobie waves at our club and that's what all of our juniors um start sailing on and learn on um and after i took a bunch of them out on the hobie 16 over um over easter first time on trapeze first time flying a hull first time going like proper proper ballistic speed like i'm, I'm doing those big screaming reaches with them on board and they're just there holding on for dear life, get to shore, and they're like, the Hobie wave is boring. <laughs> uh, they, I think they use the term, uh, the terminology poo. I'm pretty sure they use. These are like 10-year-olds. They call the Hobie wave poo, and they just want to get out on trapeze, um, racing and going fast more often. So for them, you know, it's the Dragoon is the first step, and then once they get um, – big old and ugly enough they're jumping onto a 14 nice or a 16 um you know like we all learn to sail on the hobie waves and once you get that progression it's yeah get on trapeze and and start going properly fast yeah man there's no coming back from that once you felt that that's it yeah. you're hooked it's hard to go it's hard to sit back on the boat and go yeah bobbing, bobbing up and down yeah yeah all right paddy i'm gonna let you go um Thanks very much for uh, staying up late uh, to have this chat. No, I, no worries. I hope that everyone's got a lot out of this. I certainly have. And I've, I'm so keen to get into some more Hobie 14 racing. Uh, where that'll be, I don't know. But um, yeah, so thanks very much, man. Enjoy your uh, your holidays. And um, yeah, I will do. If anyone wants any questions, you know, hit us up. Always free to... Man, I'm a teacher, so I'm always always very keen to share information and and help get the help build the fleet and get people up to that up to speed basically yeah um, you, you can contact paddy yeah. through to totally immersed 
TV on YouTube, that's probably the best way. Just watch the videos, uh, comment on the videos, and uh, Paddy will get back to you. Uh, he is definitely uh, the knowledge, um, part of this knowledge group from Australia who's been doing more Hobie 14 uh, research and development than anybody else on the planet. So uh, you're not going to find any better information on it anywhere else. Um, yeah, thanks very much, man. Unreal, man. Thanks oh, for having us. All right, nice Chat one. Soon. Nice one. All right. See you, everyone. All right. Cheers. Cheers, man. I'll leave you to it. All right, Bye. nice one, dude. So there goes Paddy. Um, thanks very much again to Paddy for um, for joining us. Uh, today uh, it's slightly different format in today's q and a i'm sure you've noticed i just like to um you know i like to make sure that everyone feels like i've said hello so hello to iska gaming hello to scott dropping it in the slot hello to leland lee hello to jason uh need more backstage footage with mb and hazel says jason uh we've got jack on board uh Oh, it, Jack's question. Do you think now that you're full time on YouTube, you can make some windsurfing content? I could, but I'm not going to because I have to stay in my, uh, what would you call it? In my zone. My my area of expertise is um, is, of course, catamaran sailing. And I've got to stay in my wheelhouse. I think that is the term. Um, but there is another guy in, um, if you haven't come across him, you should check him out on YouTube. His, he's called Cookie and his channel is called Ride Alongs. It's, it's Ride Alongs with Cookie. And all of his videos, same format as mine, uh, from Vasiliki Bay. And they're very good videos. There we go. Um... All right, we've got Sasha K on board. Any chance to advise is use NACRA 570 good for a first boat in Europe uh, concerned about maintenance? Yeah, it's a pretty good boat as a first boat. To be honest, any catamaran which has either skeg hulls or asymmetric hulls, if for your first boat, better to steer away from boats which have centerboards or dagger boards which does make the 570 a good choice it is one of the bigger um nacras because uh 570 is i think that's 19 feet long so it's quite a big boat depends if you're looking at sailing single-handed or with a crew if you want to sail with three people on board um that is what you'd need to consider i'd say if you're going to be sailing single-handed or with a friend um maybe the 500 or the 5.0 is a slightly better choice just it's a smaller boat all right we've got kevin on board kevin joined me for some sailing on his Karumba hobie 16 down in ocean springs mississippi last week that was nice spicy fist one is on board as well all right um jose is with us how are you doing jose great to have you with us and um, all right, Dopey Dave says, I'm sailing vicariously through Joyrider TV now. Very good. OK. Also on board, we've got CBR1KRR from Chicago. Here we go. Um, how long would it take to become proficient on a Hobie 14 coming from a Hobie getaway um, or smaller? Yeah, it's kind of like. Just don't expect, I think it's it's almost like getting on the 14 off a different type of boat for the first time is a little bit about managing frustration because the 14, because it's got these low volume hulls, it is more prone to stalling than other catamarans and it's more difficult to get it going than other catamarans. So if you can... Um, just deal with the frustration when you can't get it going and you're like why won't this thing go and learn the back it up to get it going technique which is um, basically push the boom out 
push the rudders away a bit, boat backs around the corner, then you can start going forwards. Then, um, to be honest, a Hobie 14 will make you a better catamaran sailor more quickly than any other type of catamaran because it doesn't accept less than perfect technique. Um, yes, you can sail it imperfectly and that'll be fun, but going around the corners, tacking especially, it uh, does require good technique. Uh, if, you, if you had one whole week of good conditions, by the end of that week, if you really apply yourself, you would be, I would say, at the level on the 14, which you would have been on your previous boat going into that week. All right, we've got Ryan on board in Maui, uh, fixing my 14 with hopes of flying it again. Love the show. Thanks, Ryan. Great to have you on board, uh, as always. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, so, Declan. Um, hello, Declan. Sorry if I didn't say hello. Um, so, he says, 65 races, question mark, to be a great grandmaster. No, it's uh, 65 years old. So, if you're over 65 years old, then you qualify for the great grandmaster class at Hobie events. There we go. Got Justin with us. Loved watching the Hobie 14 videos. Thanks very much. I liked making them possibly even more than you liked watching them. It really was such a great event. And I'm absolutely serious that I would love to go and do some more Hobie 14 racing. It's, it's just a different game altogether. Sailing single-handed is different for a start. And then on the small boat, which doesn't take any prisoners, it is good. Like in my first race, I blew a tack. You might have seen it on the video. And I was a little bit concerned. I was like, oh, well, that's my race over. But like um, like we were just talking about with Paddy, everybody is getting some bad tacks in their race, even the guys at the front of the fleet. So just because you've blown a tack doesn't mean that you've blown the race. Whereas if you're on a different type of boat, like racing the Tornado, if you do a bad tack like that that takes you 20 seconds or more, yes, your race is going to be uh, less good generally. All right. Christian's on board who says, don't forget to smash that like button. Thanks, Christian, for the reminder for everyone. Oh, Declan agrees. Let's show some likes. Um, all right, we've got Aaron on board in New Zealand. Thanks for tuning in, Aaron. Um, Philip's with us in Ireland. Weather, weather is still crappy as always. I can, I can reliably inform you, I've just got back to Greece uh, two days ago from the USA. And it was like, when I left, it was the winter. I've now returned and it is Scorchio. Yeah, it's very warm here indeed. Um, news just in, I just fitted the trampoline uh, from Salt City Sailing on my Project 16 Bad Boy 95 today. And um, I hope I did video the process. So if anybody needs to put a trampoline on and aren't 100% sure in how that works, um, I'll be... There'll be a video to say this is how it works. All right. So who else have we got on board? Um, <laughs> Christian says, I would totally watch a, a series called Joe Tries Other Types of Sailing. Maybe that's something I can do this summer is maybe once a week I could uh, go on a different type of boat, which you've never seen me sail before. Uh, like start off on the Optimist, finish off on the 49er. Nice. Dopey Dave says, come to Cyprus. Oh, yes. All right. Christian says, I was just accepted into race to Alaska, just not on a catamaran. Ah, oh, it's a shame that not on a catamaran. But anyway, uh, still, it's going to be epic. All right. Justin says, I sail a Hobie 18, feel caught between... 16 and tornado but i take what you give and try to utilize on my boat yeah exactly um yeah so unfortunately we haven't actually had an 18 here 
at Wild Wind in Greece for about 25 years now, I think, um, when the Hobie Tiger first came along. Uh, that's when we kind of foolishly, you could argue, uh, decided, right, there's a new 18-foot boat, the Tiger, so we don't need the old 18-foot boats anymore. We're going to switch them out for the Tigers. There we are. I'd uh, just like to say thank you very much to Philip for the super sticker. Oh, yes, that is going to pay for a very tasty beverage later on. Thank you very much for that, Philip. If anybody else would like to drop a super sticker, do feel free. Uh, I, I'm not bashful about accepting such donations to the cause. All right, and we've got Sasha with us. Hello, Sasha. Great that you could make it. Um, so... Um, what is going to happen if I do this? I don't know. All right. Um, yes. So, uh, just in response to, um, one question, uh, and this comes from Kevin, who hopefully is still in the live chat with us, who was asking about the shape of the race course. Oh, thanks very much, Justin. That is very kind indeed uh very decent of you much appreciated um as we go into this preloaded question from kevin he he said is the course diamond shaped so a sailing boat race course and the answer would be well kind of it is because what we generally have uh just to really put it in its most basic form is we generally have two boys like this upwind and downwind uh so i'm just gonna change my uh thing there yes so we have two boys upwind and downwind and we sail generally what might go on is we leave the boys on the left hand side so in fact let's use the little boats so you might sail up this way if we're trying to minimize the amount of tacks and jibes that we're doing we go up this way when we're just beyond 90 degrees to the windward mark we tack like this and then we'd steer around the buoy onto a broad reach same tack so we're still on starboard tack here and then the angles that we're jibing at on the downwind um, are the same as the angles that we're tacking at, like the opposite angles that we're sailing on the upwind. So when we get to that 90 degrees, then we jibe. And then, so it is kind of a diamond shape. Like this. <coughs> The actual shape of the race course is just straight up and downwind. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily sail this way round. Like at the events at Ocean Springs, at the downwind buoy, we actually had two buoys. So you could choose to go around either of them depending on the, the factors that would come into which buoy you're going to go around is number one, which side of the course is there more wind? More wind equals you're going to sail faster. So um, you'd either go around this way, so you'd come out on starboard tack or come out this way on port tack, um, which meant a lot of the time we were going around uh, to come out on starboard tack, but then if I just use this as the windward mark, I've run out of circles, um, but then rather than going all the way to the end, because if we go all the way to the end, it means we don't have any options when we're sailing up to the boy, because we're going to go around leaving it on the left side. Uh, we don't have any options because we can't put in any more tax or anything. And um, if the wind shifts at all, if it shifts uh, this way, it means we will have sailed a distance which is further than we needed to. So much better to tack. What I like doing is going two thirds of the way on starboard, then tacking. So we end up 
kind of close to the boy but not on it and then we tack here makes for a much easier mark rounding as well so more efficient so there we go i hope that helps there kevin um in explaining the race course okay so i think at this time i am gonna wrap things up and say thanks to everybody for tuning in thanks again to paddy who is staying up late he actually went to bed and then got up again uh to do the live stream so thanks to paddy for um his input in this afternoon's live stream and next week we'll be back to normal in or actually am i going to england next week on friday yes i am so maybe next week's q and a we will actually do on the thursday if everybody can make that that would be great um and it will be a very standard format q and a where um i'll be aing to your queue so thanks very much and i'll see you soon with some more on joyrider tv thank you thank you very much thank you